The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Pastor Mike, good afternoon. It's seven minutes past midday. Live from Douglas in the Isle of Man. Man in line's on with you through till one. Well, the Manxman's going to start birthing trials in Liverpool at the end of the month. Now, being as she can't discharge freight there, pretty expensive passenger journey. Chairman of the Housing and Community Board says uh, there has been progress made on housing on the Isle of Man. And um, uh, what else has been happening across? Oh, Manx Care's forecast overspend is down to £16.8 million. £16.8 million overspend. An improved picture compared to figures in July when they said it was going to be £18.7 million. So down £2.1 million. Pounds. The budget for the Isle of Man's health service is just under £347 million per year. The latest board meeting members said that such things as pay awards are adding pressure to the finances. Robert's on with us now. Hi, Robert. Hi, how you doing? They're talking about all of this expense, like they've lost, like they've lost money down the back of the city or something like that, you know? I mean, it's our money at the end of the day. So, uh, what, 300, well, it's basically £350 million pounds a year to run uh, Manx Care, and they say £16.8 million overspend. I, I mean, how do you yeah, feel about that? How much money have they got left? How much money have they got left? I don't think they've got much, have they? Well, I mean, they get money on an ongoing basis from, uh, from Treasury. So, uh, you know, if the uh, Department of Health and Social Security makes representations to the Treasury because they need money, then uh, bluntly, you know, money has to be found one way or another well yeah but yesterday we were talking about the boats and it was 303 million wasn't it uh, in total yeah i mean this expense can't go on can it well it depends how much we're earning i mean you know as long as we're earning more than we spend we're okay uh, it just depends. Have we, got an effect, have we got an effective opposition to in Timwall to um, address the matter in terms of uh, you know putting the checks and balances? And I don't think we have because if you look at Labour, um, you've got um, Farragher and you've got Maltby, and quite often they contradict each other. So I mean, I don't think we've got an effective opposition to do anything. Well, I mean, we don't really have party politics as such. I mean, the, you know, there's there's a liberal uh, liberal van in there, as you say. There are two Labour members, uh, uh, Manx Labour Party members, but really, Comyn runs uh, the government. The Council of Ministers runs the government, and the Chief Minister is at the head of that. Really, uh, the backbenchers provide some sort of opposition, but really, it's run by. Yeah. I mean, that's our system. We've got the Council You're of right. Ministers. You're right, and I think Stu Peters needs to step up his game a bit and put them all the back into the checks and balances to actually get some backbench, you know, um, talking um, going over at Timwall to see what's going on. But I mean, Robert, everybody, now, you know, they? everybody wants uh, health care. It's just a matter of how how much it costs and who's running it. And as it is now, we've had Manx Care for three years. Before that, it was the department that ran it. So, uh, and they were supposed to find some savings. Well, it won't be long before they're taking the debt pill, will it? Because they're running out of money. Well, well, we'll soon find out. All right. Thanks, Robert. Bye. Good to hear from you. And John's with us now. Hi, John. Hi, Andy. Uh, just two things, actually. But the first one, we came back on the boat yesterday afternoon. Yeah, on the Manxman. Yeah, it was delayed. We got in about 8 o'clock. Right. Um we drove along Douglas Promenade as it was getting it was getting dark and one thing that what a depressing place to first impression the lighting was it was just absolutely depressing 
and there must have been, I think there was four, if not five coaches, English coaches on that boat. And I thought, I wonder what impression they get, because it was, it, it just looked so dull and depressing. Uh, what do you think, I mean, what's changed then? Is it the, the standard of lighting, uh, the fact that the festoon lights have gone? What is it? Yeah, mainly, I should say the festoon lights and the fact that the lights are... Um, well, they're just not effective. And we got to Greensill's Corner. Now, remember, it's raining, it's dark. You couldn't see the magic roundabout. Uh, so anybody not knowing it would have just driven straight through. They wouldn't have realised there was any sort of give way to the right or anything on that. But, mm. uh, well, I mean, that's, they, this is Douglas City Council's view of the future. They think, um, you know, yeah, th th this new yeah. lighting is, is uh, the be-all and end-all. Yeah. It, I don't think to get the city business, it, it was inspected very closely. That's all. But anyway, the second thing I wanted, we had been to the Shetland and Orkney Islands. Now, we went on a coach tour, and the first thing the... Uh, the tour guides pointed out the ferry service and I haven't checked these I can only go by what he said because I asked him what the fares were I gathered that the fares for two adults uh, with a car and a cabin were roughly the same as ours but you've got to bear in mind it's a 12 to 14 hour journey whether this is to Aberdeen whether it calls in at Orkney or not right so and this was that, from where that, from where to Sh uh, to Aberdeen Shetland from Shetland to Aberdeen yeah 14 hours uh, maximum and the price is roughly the same but they it's an overnight service so you, you virtually have to have a cabin but the interesting bit was residents get 35 percent discount oh crikey now it gets better. When a resident gets to 60 years of age, they get two free return trips a year. Now, how do you think the steam packet would feel about that here? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I which uh, which imagine. ferry company was it? I, do, I don't know. I haven't checked that out. I can't remember the name of the ferry company, but it was just the fact that I thought that was a damn good deal for residents. Well, they certainly, I mean, that's certainly something worth thinking about. So if anybody else has done that journey, it, what was the state of the boat like? Was it new? What was it? Was no, it no, hang on. We, we weren't on the, we didn't do the ferry. We, I'm just going by the information. We were actually on a cruise, which called in there. Right, okay. And then we did the coach tour. The ferry it lo itself looked more or less the same size as uh, the Manxman of the Ben McCree. But, uh, you know, I thought those fares, they, they were a bit too good to be true, weren't they, you know? My word. OK. Good. OK. All right. Good to hear from you. Thanks okay. for being with us today. Right. Bye now. Uh, quarter past 12. Uh, well, it's a subject we've talked about in the past uh, that John mentioned. Um, Dingy Douglas, really, and... The festoon lights are gone. There are some festoon lights around uh, South Quay, but uh, the big ones right across Douglas Promenade have gone. We now have those lamp standards with pointy things on the top that change colour. Uh, really, I just wonder what your thoughts are regarding this, because... Um, yeah, this is obviously Douglas City Council's view of the future. It's what their view, their, their kind of view of what Douglas should look like. Um, but in the dark at the moment, well, and if you're coming in on the boat, whereas before you used to be able to see the string of lights going across Douglas Bay, now the only string of lights you can see is just below us on Douglas Head. You see the string of pearls just coming up to uh, the camera obscura. 
Anyway, thoughts on that, along with our ho- halfway horse tram. Oh, and uh, the debate going on about the steam packet. This is Texter 939. Can I offer an opinion? Of course you can, 939. I stand to be corrected, but I believe after construction of the Manxman and the new ferry terminal was uh, already underway. Liverpool City Council announced that they'd approved a ban on freight movements after 10 o'clock in Liverpool because of the proximity of the luxury flats near the terminal. I'd suggest that the Manxman was never designed for Hesham, too wide, uh, but I think the Manxman was designed for Liverpool. The ban on freight movements therefore meant that Hesham had to be used for freight with a ship too wide in windy weather to safely dock. Now, if this is so, the, the ineffective government here should have banged the table with the Liverpool City Council to reverse the ban. And at the very least, the well-paid consultants on the project should be held to account for inadequate forward planning on all issues, be it docking, passenger access, freight loading, to consider all issues. In addition, an air bridge links to an aircraft which is stable on the ground. Uh... Thank you, uh, 939. I don't know whether it was Peel, um, the Peel Group, which owned that particular piece of land. They bought the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board, so it's the Peel Group. that. Now, whether or not that was who, who put it in the lease that no freight was to be landed. And let's face it, if you'd bought a very expensive uh, six-figure apartment and you had a ferry terminal uh, coming to you, then would you really appreciate having freight landed at all hours of day or night? Anyway, that's the situation. Whoever it was, whether it was the Peel Group or whether it was Liverpool City Council or somebody didn't quite notice, well, we'll see. But that's the situation. And uh, the other one is that uh, the Manxman is going to be doing uh, birthing trials in Liverpool at the end of this month. Manxman's due to carry out those berthing trials. Steam packets say that the vessel is going to enter a short dry dock as part of routine maintenance as well as fixing the prang sustained while docking in Hesham last month. The trials are mandatory and ensures that uh, basically everybody's safe and the crew and everybody know what to do. Ben McCree's taking over Manxman sailings from 8 o'clock on the 29th of September. A date for the Ben McCree trials at the new terminal is yet to be scheduled. But as the vessel's mooring layout and stern ramp height is said to be similar to the Manxman, to expect that only minimal trials are going to be needed if Manxman is successful for the bend to nip in there. So we'll see. But um, it's not really plain sailing, is it? I believe the Isle of Man has become like Alcatraz. We're prisoners here on the scruffy rock whose heritage is being stolen. Now, who in their right mind is going to want to move here? We want 15,000 extra people. Finding a safe boat to take us away uh, is on most people's mind. Get the government out. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, 775. I don't know how to point this out to you, but the government's in for five years. It's it's how it works. Tinwald is in for five years. It's voted in. And then we have uh, September 2026. We've got an election and we'll see what's what. So, have the ring fence uh, national insurance health contributions been blown away already by Manxcare? Says, gee, Sammy, Manxcare's overspent again. (laughs) Uh, That will be the pay to the new director posts that they've created at Nobles Hospital. Most, if not of all, are made up of people who have come from the UK. Hmm. How many other senior posts have been created at Nobles Hospital in the last year, says Sammy. And it might be nice to know, also a note in from Christine, who's just said, how many people, how many senior people who work for Manx Care don't live on the Isle of Man? And if they don't live on the Isle of Man, are we paying their expenses to come here for travel and accommodation? Are we saying that we can't recruit enough people to come and live on the Isle of Man to work for Manx Care? And, says Christine, other government departments. Why all the surprise, says JC? What are you surprised about, about the Manx Care overspend? Don't forget the 2p tax increase. thought the whole reason was to cover the inevitable Manx Care overspend. And Gary, in the north, it's a lovely end of summer's day in Ramsey. I bet on the mainstream media they don't mention that Germany's closed all its borders. It doesn't really affect the Isle of Man, but yes, I did notice that. Germany is, uh, I think it's, is it with uh, Hungary, I think? 
uh, they're turning people back at that particular border. But uh, not much to do with the Isle of Man. However, Eddie's on now. Hi, Eddie. Hiya. You all right? Good, thanks. Good. I've been in listening mode for a bit, uh, but uh, just two or three little snippets, if I may. Um, listening to some of your other comments, we stayed at the Best Western uh, not long back, yeah. and we paid extra for the, the room with the view at the front, and uh, the, the, the lights are terrible. <laughs> they are absolutely horrible, honestly. It's it, it used to be part of the atmosphere uh, of the whole of the promenade, the the lights, but. It's uh, a, a bit of a nothing now, I'm afraid. Douglas City Council don't seem to agree. I mean, they don't, They don't. Um, you know, it, it's not really a priority as far as they're concerned. They got rid of the festoon lights. I think they said it was because the, the new lamp standards were too far apart to put the festoon lights. They, they may droop or fall down or something. And then, of course, they st- they got rid of the lights that go- used to go across the road. So we can no. assume this is Douglas City Council's view of the future of Douglas. Uh, mind you, they must yeah. be saving electricity. Yeah, they don't bother asking the public, though, do they, about anything these days. I think the general public would have kept them. Um, secondly, um, steam packet fares. Yeah. Uh, you had somebody on a few minutes ago. Uh, do you recall me telling you about the fare for a two and a half hour journey to uh, Isle of Isla? Was that was uh, it a Calmac one you went on? No, it, uh, Caledonian MacBray. Yeah, Calmac. Yeah. Yeah. What, oh, sorry, that is yeah. Um, yeah, uh, for pension. That guy was saying uh, is it a third off for. Pensioners on yeah, that he did one. say that. He, he did. No, no, he said that pensioners, uh, when he got to pensionable age, he got two free return tickets a year. Yeah, well, do you recall what I said the passenger fare was for a, pa- a passenger? Sounded like cheap as chips, if I remember. £2.50. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> that's more expensive. That's cheaper. It is cheaper than chips. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. Uh, another little snippet is... Um, just for the Aristain people, the MUA say we're the windiest place on earth. And, uh, you know, we've also got the funnel effect there, which is it increases even more. Well, I was reading uh, that somewhere in China, um, typhoon proof, six of them, uh, of the new ones, they blew down in a typhoon. Did you hear about it? Uh, no. Whereabouts was that again? Somewhere in China. Right. I, did, I, I can't find the exact uh, location. We're for not you, prone to tycoons in uh, typhoons in Erie Stain, though, are we? Well, we're the windiest place on earth, according to the MUA. So oh, why no. not? I think they might they might have something <laughs> to say about that in the Falkland Islands, but never mind. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But the, well, we know the Falkland Islands and. And Orkneys are the windiest place in Britain, but the MUA seem to think it's Airy Stain. Yeah. Yes, do you what? agree? Well, well, no, it's your opinion. What's on your mind? What else is on your mind? Uh, I can't remember the other thing now. There's so many things going wrong at the moment. Oh, the, well, what I was going to say was that, you know, the government want to do a, a brand new plan, and my idea of a brand new plan would be to reduce the fares uh, on steam packet that much that we bring a load of people over. Then they'll have this fifteen thousand pound, uh, fifteen thousand people extra uh, because they could afford it, and uh, and and also definitely make the Isle of Man an, a national park, and that will bring people as well. And also, while I'm on about national parks, Cumbria are now applying for national park status. And that's the area where everybody's up in arms, apart from uh, other places in Britain, about all the new pylons to carry all the cables. So I think Airy Stain is a no-go, don't you? They're, they're keeping very quiet at the moment. Well, the, the thing is they're keeping very quiet. Nobody quite knows what's happening. It is in a period of um, consultation at the moment, isn't it? 
Well, it's, it's, they've got no idea what they're doing, so we don't know. We, we haven't got a clue what they're up to, but we have already put so many things uh, in, in, in the way of them. Um, they know that we're going to take them to court anyway uh, if they do decide to go ahead with it. So I think they may be thinking twice. OK. Hopefully, anyway. All right. All right, Eddie. Good to hear from yeah. you. Thanks for that. Cheers, mate. Uh, the company that goes from the Shetlands to Aberdeen apparently is Northlink Ferries, which is owned by like, the, um, the multinational defence, health um, and space and justice and migration, CERCO, they're called. I think they seem to own most of Britain. Anyway, uh, Northlink Ferries apparently is the company, but interested to hear their particular savings and offers uh, for people of the Shetland Islands. And Peter's on now. Hello, Peter. Hello, Andy. It's Peter Murcott here. Yeah. Uh, about this 16.3 million yeah. overspend. Yeah. Problem is, uh, with the question of health, it's uh, obviously a big spender, and there's always dangers that the, it'll keep going up and up. I'm going to repeat what I've said before, which will be one means of it, perhaps reducing the amount that it'll go up by, and it will go up. As I've pointed out several times, they're proposing to spend public money on uh, a self-defeating strategy. And you'll know what it is, because I know you don't like the subject. But they've got their suicide provision strategy. It's gone through the keys, and it's now going to go to the LegCo. Yeah. Uh, they do not know how much that is going to cost. The work questions asked throughout uh, by uh, certain MHKs and more strength to their elbow. And the only thing that they were able to discover was that it hasn't been costed out. Now, here is a strange thing. If you are proposing to do something, you don't wait until it's got through and then suddenly discover what you've done. I would have thought the legislature, first of all, should insist that they want to know exactly what are they voting for, given the fact that they're spending public money in two contradictory ways, which is hardly good governance at the Isle of Man, because last October they um, received a document, to which I've got a copy, of the amounts that was, uh, it was, was going to be spent on a, uh, a very laudable strategy called the Suicide Prevention Strategy. I didn't understand all of the way the figures were set out, but I could see that there were some very substantial sums. Now, those substantial sums are going to be really nullified because they're spending those, those substantial sums on something which is impossible of attainment because they built it in with what they're already proposing to do, if it gets through LegCo, um, of spending an unknown sum which will do or undo the good work that's being done by the uh, suicide prevention strategy. So I know that uh, I'm not, I haven't got any degree in financial management and so on, but even I know that if you spend money in one way, and then you spend money that's actually contradictory and that undoes all the thing that you're doing, uh, then, then that's not a good way of spending money. I mean, it's like building a house and then asking somebody to come along and knock it down and building it again. So, what, and, Peter, what do you, you know, think? What do you think that they think they're doing if if this is what's happening? Well, the, the first problem, Andy, is that they will not accept. They're living in cloud cuckoo land and they like it there because they are insisting that the bill that they're putting through is not about assisted suicide. Now, I know that yours is an opinion program, but it isn't a question of opinion here. It's a question of fact that if you hand somebody the means to kill himself and then he uses those means to kill himself that person has committed suicide. He's killed himself. That's what suicide means, self-killing. Now, that's not an opinion. That is a fact. It's uh, look in any dictionary and see how they define it. Um, so my uh, suggestion is that before they go any further with this bill, whichever, whatever side you're coming from on it, just 
on the question of the finance. Remember, you do not know what this is going to cost. You've already committed yourself to try and get rid of all suicides, and yet you've got a bill which will result in people committing suicide and all that that entails. And surely that is one reason on which everybody can agree on that you've got to make up your mind what you're trying to achieve, whether you agree with the bill that's going through or not. And if you want to allow, enable people to commit suicide, then what is the point of spending public money, which I wholeheartedly agree with, and I've seen some of the um, advertisements and some of the posters on it, and I, 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 I think it's very praiseworthy, but you cannot, when you're running a country, spend money in two contradictory ways, and even less, if you cannot see what you are doing, i.e. that you are uh, producing something which is totally contradictory, my view is those who can't see it should not be in government. Because if they can't see something as simple as that, then what are they doing there? Okay. Uh, it's a very plain proposition. Um, and so where do you think, I mean, it, it, and we've had many people who've testified that they've had uh, loved ones, friends and relatives who've been in, in, in insufferable pain. Do you think then that the hospice is the, the backstop as far as this is concerned? Yes. It's been proven to be, and, 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 um, and, and that is right. And you see, even with the bill that they've got, there are some very serious fundamental flaws, and people have tried to do something about that, and they have failed. There seems to be a determined majority to steamroll this through, come what may, and talk about not listen to reason isn't in it. You can. When I spoke with the members, the ones who came along, we um, there were eleven of them turned up, and they were people of varying opinions. And the first thing that I said was, "I'm not going to talk to you about the pros and cons because I think you've had it all to saturation point already. I'm simply going to tell you what this bill contains." and where there are some very significant and some serious pitfalls in it. And that is what I'm going to do. And I did so for 40 minutes, and I had questions asked to me. So they have been well apprised of what the things are. And in some cases, there are still some very glaring problems, and they just haven't been attended to. But the one thing that I did point out to them was what I've just said. So um, I'm going to go on saying it. Uh, maybe even if I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, uh, I mean, because we're in a wilderness situation where we've got people in the House of Keys who are prepared to spend our money in two contradictory, self-defeating ways. And if they are prepared to do things like that, all that I can say is they shouldn't be there. And they should be replaced by people who have at least an understanding of reality and who take a decision in which way they're going to spend the money. Okay. And that's what we haven't got, I'm sorry to say. I appreciate your call, Peter. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. OK, 26 minutes before one. Um, I was following, uh, following on from your first caller, says Lynn. Last time I was on the boat, I was sitting next to some people from the south of England. Never been to the Isle of Man before. As the boat was pulling into Douglas Harbour, one of the ladies said, Oh dear, it looks a bit shabby. Not a good first impression. And uh, talking about Douglas being dingy, what about Derby Square? Uh, this was once the pride of Douglas, but its roads are seriously potholed to the point that they are an absolute disgrace. And the park's dingy as well. Nobody in Douglas Council seems to be interested in this once lovely place. Hartford Homes and Kell Properties have spent millions of pounds on lovely new houses and the owners are a bit seriously being let down by, by the council. Thanks also so to Les, who just said uh, Douglas councillors don't care about Douglas. They're too busy trying to save the world. If only they looked at what they'd done to Douglas Promenade and had a good think, then maybe they'd consider their uh, positions. Do you think that? Do you think Douglas councillors are, are too busy trying to save the world? 
that they're just not bothered about Douglas? Of course, they've halved the bin collection, but was that to save the world or just to save money? Howard's on now. Hi, Howard. Hello, Andy. Just in reference, you say, to Derby Square, do you remember, oh, in the last 18 months exactly when, I can't remember, there used to be a, a large pole in the centre of oh, Derby Square. Like a maypole? It was, but on top of that was a wind vane, a weather vane. Yeah. And the council said they were going to take it down, uh, which they did, uh, because it was unsafe, and then they were going to replace it. Well... When you're driving around there, you've got to keep your eyes on what you're doing, but I don't think anything has been replaced. So this is another one of the false promises that the town, the city council bring out, and they come up with these harebrained schemes. But I agree with that personally. Um, and they haven't got the gardeners they used to have. They yeah. don't employ them. So the places have been run by or been done by contractors who have the idea now of planting perennial plants, shrubs, bushes, etc., because they can just go around with a hedge trimmer and trim them down. But there's nothing uh, where they're planting plants as such. Certain areas are nice. I will not disagree with that, but... It seems to be getting to the habit now where they're filling these places up with uh, perennial plants. In other words, it's cheap and cheerful. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think. Woodburn, the Woodburn Square looks kind of... It's a bit overgrown at times, Woodburn Square. Mm -hmm. And there's one by Hillary Road as well, isn't there? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they don't have the staff in the parks department. And the lads that they do have going around cutting the grass, they're going well... <laughs> Jensen Button would have a job to overtake the lads on the tractors. They're going that hard. And that's the point, that we're not talking about the people who actually do the work on the ground. We're not no. talking about the people who pick up the tools and you know and cut the foliage back. We're talking about somebody somewhere has made a decision. Somebody's gone to a, 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 um, a, a screen, uh, if you like, they've gone to uh, and decided how much is going to be spent and what the priorities are. And again, yeah. it comes back to aesthetics, how it looks. Is it... Well, that's Exactly it, what it is. Is and it pretty? We we drive around and uh, move around. And I've got grandson and his friend over here this week, and um, he was saying how it's changed uh, because um, he hasn't been over for a couple of three years. And he said how it's changed. He said, but it's not the same now. He said it doesn't look anything like it used to. He said the promenade, as that man said earlier on, is dull. He hadn't seen the promenade since it had been done. He says there's no light, there's no life, there's nothing. But surely, uh, Howard, I mean, the people at Douglas Council or in government or in tourism or whatever it is, visit Isle of Man, surely alarm bells should be clanging. If no. we don't look as attractive as we used to do, and plainly we don't, then surely something must have to be done. Well, this again was um, the people that were running or were the council. Uh, they were business people of the island, of Douglas. And if Douglas was doing well, they did well. If Douglas did very poorly, they suffered. So they were naturally, you were going to or they were going to uh, make it an en enterprising area where people are proud to come in and proud to do their work. Yeah. And you only have to look up, as I say, up in Douglas Head, they do a certain area, and beyond that, there's nothing. You, you, you take a machete with you and fight your way through it. Uh, it is it's, um, where you go round to the Coast Guard shelter and round and come out the far side onto the Marine Drive. Yeah. It's weed-ridden. Yeah. And, you know, this is what the people are coming and rambling. And where you come up from the lighthouse, it was about eight or nine inches wide, the path. The rest was completely overgrown. You know, this is something... Well, it's not only the corporation, but they fight between themselves whose it is, DOI or corporation. So if they're fighting between themselves, there's obviously nothing getting done. But that aside, as I say, that man was right with the promenade. It's, <laughs> it looks dull and it's dark and <clears throat> people have got the, the wrong impression of the roundels. They are only an ornament on the road. Yeah. They are not a legal thing. And the police have said this when it was first mooted and people started raising this. 
It's an unmarked junction. Oh, That's right. what the police have said. <clears throat> for diluted up in the highway code, and an unmarked junction is a main road with a B road. And the B road gives way to the main road. But who defines which is the B road and Broadway or the promenade? I'm just trying to remember, <clears throat> having driven down there at night, are the Randalls, is it reflective paint on the Randalls? I don't know. I, no. you know I, I don't do a lot of driving at night. Now. But having said that, I can't imagine it would be. It looks like it's um, um, a coloured bitumen or something of that ilk into the roads. But it's not going to be. I see they were down there the other day last... A week today I was down on the prom, and they were repairing the pavements already. The, the highway board were down there repairing pavements um, where on the uh, the garden side. But the promenade itself is breaking up where all these um, crossings and artificial crossings and Lord knows, they're starting because of the traffic. That's not going to last any more than a couple of years now before they have to do a major restructuring on it. But what it come on for, actually, was when that other chap was talking about the ferries. What people tend to forget, Calmac and the Scottish government are hand in glove and there are serious subsidies going from the Scottish government right. to keep what is the lifeline, and I'll use that lifeline, to all the islands around the Scottish coast. But that one that chap was talking about coming from Shetland Isles, that's run by Northlink. Right. And I can only assume that's a private company. And they have two ferries and about the size of the, the Ben. Uh, and uh, I've just looked it on the internet and it's shown one uh, uh, fairly modern ferries but that is uh, another lifeline up to, to the, the Shetland Isles and Orkney Isles etc but they can offer subsidies but the subsidies from the government the Scottish government to CalMac um, they're running into tens of millions of pounds per annum now if the people of the island want to have the Isle of Man government taxpayers who a lot don't use the vessels, paying subsidies to everybody else that does use the vessels to keep the fares down. Uh, I think there'd be a hue and cry about it. You know, th this is the, um, the silly part about it. The, the Scottish government are caught up in it now because CalMac is largely owned by the government. But they've got a series of ferries waiting, and there's the two ferries that were being built for them, Still not finished yet, yeah. and they were going to be thirty, forty million pound a piece. At the moment, the cost is somewhere in the region of four hundred million pound, and I don't yeah. think they even got the bottoms yet. Good yet. grief! <clears throat> yep. So the steam packet itself, well, if they're supposed to be arms length, they're fixing a, a rate that will make a profit because in the next couple of years. They've got to, in their contract with the government, to replace the fast craft. Uh, and this makes me think that they'll keep the arrow, put the Manxman on the Liverpool trip, they'll keep the, uh, the Ben and get rid of the fast craft because they are uh, consumed fuel. Uh, quite considerably for any journey. Yeah. I don't think they're the ones that's making any profit. And the the difference in the speed is minimal now. Okay. But um, how strange that, that Ben McCree went out with extra freight on and how convenient, or was it a PR, where she had to lie off Hisham yesterday and couldn't get in because of that particular northwest wind. I wonder. All right. I wonder. All right, thanks, Howard. OK, take care. Bye okay. now. If you're walking in the country and you drop a piece of rubbish, you pick it up. It's only a small piece of rubbish. But we all try and do our bit for nature and the well-being of the planet although a lot of countries don't care, I say, uh, says uh, John, Russia, China and places like that. We must all do our bit to make a difference for the future and for future generations, whether it's wind farms or the use of bus services, says Big John. Ah, but the buses have to be there in the first place, Big John. Ramsey Art Gallery, for a wide range of watches, jewellery, arts and gifts for him and her, are closed for a short break. We'll be open again shortly. Follow our Facebook page or listen out for our advert. Thank you for supporting Ramsey Art Gallery. 
Don't miss the B&B Furniture Mega Anniversary Sale. With prices rising elsewhere, B&B is celebrating in style with our anniversary price drop sale. As well as great savings and free accessory vouchers, look out for our manager specials with up to 45% off and immediate delivery. Plus, everything's available with up to three years 0% finance and no deposit to pay. Join the party at B&B Furniture in Snugborough with the Mega Anniversary Sale, now on. At EVF service stations, you can fuel yourself as well as your vehicle. Hot and cold food to go, chilled drinks and even lottery tickets too. Great choice and value to make life more convenient. Fill up, fuel up with Ellen Van in Fuels. Visit us at evf.co.im. Stocks and offers may vary between locations. The Musicals in Concert returns to the Royal Hall Villa Marina, Sunday 13th of October, presented by Stage Ed. Featuring classic songs from the world's greatest musicals in a gala performance by stars from the London stage. The Musicals in Concert, Sunday 13th October, at the Villa Marina. Book now at villagaiety.com or on 600 555 with Zedra, Isle of Man and supported by your nation station, Manx Radio. After an impressive midweek win, FC Isle of Man returned to the bowl this weekend for their latest test in the NWCFL Premier Division. Saturday evening sees Cheadle Town become the latest visitors to Manx Shores this season with the Ravens hoping to keep up their unbeaten start to September. Join me, Rob Pritchard and Tony Meppen for FC Isle of Man versus Cheadle Town kicking off at 6 p.m. on Saturday. Manx Radio will be bringing you full live match commentary on our DAB and AM 1368 channels. Live coverage of FC Isle of Man on Manx Radio is supported by Selton, investing in our community. The Man in Line with Andy Witt. Thank you, Gemma. Gemma's been working with her calculator. She says, Andy, I've just worked out that if we're spending £350 million a year on Manx Care, that's £953,296.70p and per day on Manx Care. £953,296.70p. seventy-p. She said that works out at six million seven hundred six hundred seventy-three thousand seventy-six pounds and twelve p per week. You've got too much time on your hands, Gemma, but it's worthwhile noting then that is nine hundred and fifty-four thousand uh, pounds per per day for that is uh, is going some. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, I also need to point out that it's the Cronkavody ploughing match today, and the big spud weigh in at the Balakakan at Cronkavody today. It starts at three o'clock. Ronnie Fairburn's opening that at three o'clock today, and also to point out that uh, a week on Saturday and Sunday, it's the Mananin Sheepdog Trials at Bishop's Court Farm in Kirk Michael. Free entry, 9.30 to 4pm. Have fun. Julian's with us now. Hello, Julian. Hi, Andy. Um, that's a lot of money you're talking about there. I wonder how many pots of um, vitamin D you could buy for that for everybody. £954,000 a day for Manx Care. Yeah. Not small potatoes, you might say. Not really, no, no. Talking of Cronkavody, no. <laughs> um, yeah, just uh, listening to Peter a bit earlier, um, just uh, interesting, there's a couple of um, bits of news uh, in the assisted dying world. Um, the first couple uh, who happen to be British have signed up to using suicide pods. Uh, Peter and Christine Scott, who are 86 and 80 respectively, have made the decision to go to Switzerland following um, Christine's recent diagnosis of early stage vascular dementia. An Australian doctor, Philip Nitschke, uh, founder of pro-euthanasia group, uh, group um, Exit International and the creator of the new Sarco pod, which is being referred to as the Tesla of euthanasia, which rapidly pumps nitrogen into the pub, causing um, unconsciousness and death. Um, and despite Peter being in good health and having six grandchildren, he wants to be euthanized with Christine in the pod. Um, Dr. Nitschke started performing euthanasia in 96 in Australia when they first introduced assisted suicide legislation. However, um, Nitschke started promoting euthanasia for anyone, including troubled teenagers, uh, resulting in Australia stopping uh, their scheme at the time. And then since then, he tried to move to the US and the Netherlands, but I think they found him rather extreme. So he's now set up this business in Switzerland. Um, but Swiss public prosecutor Peter Sticher has accused Nitschke of glamorizing suicide and warned that there's no reliable information about the effectiveness of the method of killing inside the pod. 
and who exactly has control over the mechanical process. So, where I mean, um, Julian, I, where do you stand on our, uh, our assisted dying legislation? Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? I'm just failing to understand how there are so many questions over it, you know, the practicalities. And I'm not saying that there aren't reasons to do it, just like there are nasty people that um, should have the death penalty. Um, it's just a question, as we've said before, of, of, of things moving on. But, I mean, this guy is doing this, and several Swiss prosecutors in, Swi- you know, in Switzerland, um, there's a damning report from MIT uh, saying that um, massive, fast flushes of uh, nitrogen can cause painful death. And there's another thing that's interesting. In Australia, um, David O'Connell, a Queensland coroner has recently criticised the state's voluntary assisted suicide scheme, known as VAD, following the death of an elderly man who was given someone else's fatal drugs. And that's occurred within 107 days of the VAD scheme being re-implemented. Okay. And O'Connell said the VAD law has provided lethal substances to persons with no medical training, no regulatory oversight, and in a period of great personal and emotional turmoil. So this kind of asks the question... What's to stop someone pretending to want to die and then giving it to an unauthorised person? Because but, I mean, uh, let's bring this back to the Isle of Man. Dr. Allenson has maintained that uh, you have to be diagnosed with a terminal condition. It has to be terminal. It will be in a, within a certain period of what's, what will be timed as your natural death from that terminal condition. There are residency requirements, so there'll be no tourism where that's concerned. Um, I mean, if Dr. Allenson seems convinced that the the legislation will be um that it'll have integrity and it will be fit for the isle of man yeah but um theo boa that started all this off in 2000 in belgium is now very much against it because of the slippage in the law the, the slippery right. slope as you might say and who knows when somebody is definitely i mean there's plenty of people who go into spontaneous remission as well and also you have new cures so it's almost, um, you know, the, the, the hope of, you know, even just wanting to, to, to just see if a, a cure can be. And, you know, there's all sorts of question marks over the quality of food these days and what's in it. Um, you know, some of these people may be being put into a, a position of, of having to make these decisions. You know, A, because the, um, the palliative care service isn't doing too well these days and also... You know, what are we eating these days? You hear about all kinds of things from Monsanto and things. I mean, it makes you wonder if, if people are being kind of nudged into these uh, into these positions where they have to make a decision like this. OK. All right, Julian, we appreciate your call. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Andy. Cheers. Seven minutes before one. Um, a note in. Will they have done a survey to charge rent on the car park spaces at the Bowl car park? This is what they're talking about charging for car park spaces at the bowl and the permits in Hills Meadow for UCIOM users. Uh, Will this push all the vehicles to park anywhere regularly on double yellow lines at Hills Meadow? How are they going to manage this? Thanks also to Steve who just said uh, that there is a, a difference Um, between somebody who's in the last few weeks of a terminal illness being helped to die and an otherwise healthy person who decides to end their lives. It's completely different, according to Steve. It's completely fair that the government should try to help people in both of the situations, i.e. somebody who's in the last few weeks of a terminal illness being helped to die if they're in um, uh, you know, insufferable pain and a healthy person who decides to end their own life. It's complicated, isn't it? Talking about the state of Douglas Promenade, who's in charge of tourism now? No tourist board? Well, it hasn't been for a long time. No Department of Tourism. It's now rolled up into Enterprise. For the past several Sundays in the travel section of the Sunday Times, they've had large articles about the best beaches, best countryside walks, best swimming, best heritage, best small railways, all in Great Britain, not the UK. And says Mary and Ramsey, not a single mention of the Isle of Man. This is the travel section of the Sunday Times. Of course, uh, Sunday Times is often here on a Monday. Anyway, in 2022-23, health spending in the UK was three three thousand and eighty-five pounds. 
uh, per capita ranging from £3,727 per capita in London to £2,736 per capita in East England as at the 3rd of July 2024. For the Isle of Man, says this correspondent, uh, 361, that works out with those numbers at £4,117 per person. Uh, I've got a note in just to say I, I did this uh, hurriedly the other day, so I want to do it properly. And this is about uh, the lack of apprenticeship places. So a mention for Sean Collett, who left the Isle of Man recently. Um, Sean Collett gave my son, not my son, but Andy's son, uh, a chance to do uh, an apprenticeship in plastering. Hayden Harris, my son, struggled getting into an apprenticeship just after the COVID spell. Hayden Harris has just completed his City and Guild too. If it wasn't for him and his boss Joe giving him a chance, I think he'd be in a place that I wouldn't want him to be in. So well done to Sean Collett and well done to Hayden Harris now. Qualified plasterer. Well done, Hayden. And I hope it works out fine for you. You text, you email, you call and your WhatsApp. So a week on Friday, actually the Enterprise Minister will be here with uh, Chief Officer Mark Lewin, of course, bundled up into Enterprise, is Visit Isle of Man, what used to be our Department of Tourism. So maybe that'll come up then a week on Friday. Fortnight on Friday, the 27th, Alfred Cannon is on Man in Line. The Chief Minister will be here if you want to have a chat. Question, what is the new seawall attached to? Do they dig down to find a secure footing or is it sitting on the old walkway? What's happening, says Paul on 715. Hey, thanks to Chris Quirk on the phones today. Back tomorrow. W-I-N-T.